All right. Okay, why uh, the host is um, keep admitting the attendees to this uh, keynote speaker. So um, I would just start then because we are ready. And hello, everyone. Welcome to the keynote session. Our keynote is here. And Professor Johanna Anala, she is the senior lecturer from Faculty of Education and Culture, Tampere University, Finland. And her research focuses on curriculum change in higher education. Johanna has worked with RNUTT since 2015 on faculty development project and expand to other eight RNUT network universities. So the project that we have worked together has high impact in changing the faculty mindset and improve our faculty and pedagogy competence. So she is also my mentor that helped um, RMUTT expand uh, in, uh, if we talk about CDAO, if CDAO standard 10, when we want to change our uh, teaching uh, and want to have more teaching competence in uh, our uh, community. So her keynote today topic is academic as curriculum creators in higher education. So while we're listening to her keynote, if you have questions, please type into the chat box and then we can go through and ask her to answer after her talk. Okay, let's meet Johanna. Okay, good morning, uh, good day, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Nice, nice to see you all here. Um, I will now start my presentation. And okay. Uh, usually the question in the beginning is that can you see the slide? And I hope you can see the slide and everything goes okay. So I, I want to express my gratitude for, for inviting me to have a talk in this conference. And, and topic of today is curriculum in higher education and especially academics or uh, as teachers, they role in curriculum making. Uh, usually uh, curriculum making is uh, described with the terms like development or curriculum reform or curriculum change, uh, especially in strategic discourse. But terms like struggle and bargain appear when academics describe their experience. And I will start this uh, talk by paying attention to the contemporary trends in curriculum policy and, and which also uh, are one of these reasons why there seems to be more or less some kind of struggle during curriculum changes. Uh, I will use a cultural historical activity theory developed by Uri Engström, uh, which provides uh, some kind of structure to this talk because it enables to approach curriculum making as an activity system. I will also talk about how curriculum appears when looked from different perspectives. Special attention will be in the agency of academics in curriculum making, uh, especially what are the features that would make meaningful to join curriculum changes. Often it is tempting to approach curriculum making as a so-called engineering type of activity. This is a concept developed by Lubel who described or made distinction between an engineering type of activity and bricolage type of activity. Uh, with this engineering type of activity, Lowell refers to a rather mechanic and perhaps idealistic formula, which may work with technical instruments, but not so well with human beings. And, and that's why she refers to how this kind of bricolage type of activity where uh, individuals and groups create something new by interpreting the rules creatively and using the existing rules as a resource, uh, but also stretching them to fit their own reality. Also in our studies, we have found that curriculum change may touch deeply 
the academics expertise areas. They pedagogical philosophies, they research fields, and if they find connection between these and curriculum, it results in, in engagement in the curriculum making. But if we look more broadly, uh, the uh, general trends in higher education curriculum policy, it is shaped by national and international political, economic and labor market forces. And the role of national policy and regulatory framework varies uh, in different countries. However, today, student employability, quality standards and institutional accountability have a noteworthy impact on shaping curricula. The employability agenda has brought to the fore a return to learning outcomes that should be often industry aligned. This has emerged as the unbundling of formal curriculum and the rise of so-called micro-credentials, digital badges, or nano-units that shape the curriculum to, towards a buffet table service, often without curriculum coherence. One of the trends is to move from subject-based approach to interdisciplinary programs. In policy papers, interdisciplinary curriculum is often regarded as more forward-looking and more innovative to approach society's big problems compared to traditional discipline or subject-based curriculum. The diversity of student body with different knowledge, cultures and experiences also shape the curriculum. However, among academics and teachers, but also among curriculum researchers, these trends are not accepted as the only or as self-evident direction to follow. The questions have raised, for example, that if the knowledge has uh, slipped away from the hands of academics to the working life industry and politicians, some scholars have described this as a drift away from longer term needs of the society to more immediate needs, what market needs just today. Learning outcomes have, have been criticized by curriculum scholars because of its narrow mechanic and end product like view of education. If student is seen just like an empty space to be filled and this approach is quite different from the modern learning theories. Also, earlier research on discipline-based and interdisciplinary curricula showed that the interdisciplinary approach, if implemented in too early phase of studies, may cause a lack of depth in expertise and weaken students' access to specialist knowledge. Also, the so-called uh, 21st century skills have received much emphasis, even though researchers try to argue that they do not work separately without the knowledge. There must be knowledge somehow connected to them. And then the widening access questions to higher education has resulted in heterogeneous student population. Uh, but then there is this question that does the student have also epistemic access to the highest levels of knowledge also that if, for example, some researchers have identified that especially students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they may find this type of uh, very employment fit competencies very uh, appealing and, and motivating. But how to guarantee that also these students would have access to so-called powerful forms of knowledge, the abstract knowledge, hierarchical knowledge, and that type of knowledge, which also uh, gives access to the important discussions in society. So I would say that uh, you, you, would, you would face this type of, uh, and certainly have faced this type of uh, negotiations in your university, especially if it's multidisciplinary, or if you try to create a curriculum uh, with other disciplines together, uh, you also may face this type of discussions if somebody in your department is more pedagogically or educationally oriented or, or research oriented and and also if somebody is more interested in the role of universities, the broader role of universities in the society. So the cultures and histories in the higher education institutions and disciplines, uh, they are different as well as, as well as the personalities who work there. 
and they shape the norms and they shape the conventions, resulting also in the ways how curriculum is uh, in, interpreted and, and enacted in practice. So, as I said before, I will now look this kind of uh, whole system of individuals in a community making curriculum with the help of concepts of the activity system modeled by Uri Engström. And, and this activity system has six components, of, of which first three are more visible. There is always a subject, an actor, and I regard now these as, as teachers or as academics those who are responsible of teaching. Then there is certain kind of object of action, uh, a kind of what we are doing uh, and, and a kind of uh, we are doing, we are working for something and we try to find a sense and meaning in this case, sense of meaning of curriculum making in higher education. And when we do that thing, there is a certain type of outcome. And we use uh, tools, in, in this system when we are doing, when we are making curriculum, but then there are also certain type of rules, the community and the division of labor, which all affect how this curriculum is understood, how it is en enacted. So uh, using, using this model, it's possible to look how academics approach curriculum making. Uh, what are the tools that are provided for that? And, and the tools can be very simple guidelines, what we need to do, but then there are also, it's more, more complicated perhaps also to identify the norms or, or what are actually, what are the processes, what are happening. Uh, in this theory, it's quite important to no, note that there are in, in, internal and inner contradictions and tensions. And there, that's the one, which creates development. And that's the one which creates learning. It creates constant transformation and reconstructions. And that's the source of development and, and the source of change. So we should not deny that there are different type of uh, tools and we are perhaps the different tools are understood that there are different type of rules and, and different type of community members and, and divisions of labor and so on but we should use them rather as a source of learning and, and development. And, and first we will look at the object of activity. Uh, it's, it's recorded to have a key role in the activity system. It embodies the meaning, the motive and the purpose of shared work. And, and if we look at more closely, there are kind of three, three approaches to this object of activity. There is something what we are acting. Uh, and, and in this case, I, I uh, suggest it's curriculum. And there is a kind of motive for doing something with curriculum. We want to develop curriculum, we want to reform it. And there is a kind of desired outcome. Perhaps it's superior quality of teaching and learning, but it may be also something else. Uh, and, and sometimes it's not clear for academics that why we are doing this. And that's also quite important to know that why we need this reform. What's the, what's the motivation behind this? Because always when we are working with, uh, with a curriculum, it's a kind of horizon of possibility. It's a kind of raw material or problem space uh, and where, we, where our activity is directed. And, and it's then important to start discussion what are we working with? How do we understand curriculum? Do we have similar understanding of that? And this brings us to, to one, of the, one of the kind of figures where we try to identify different types of approaches to curriculum. The key variation uh, in this model is that there, there you can find uh, uh, Curriculum may have a different orientation towards knowledge and towards ownership. So uh, the knowledge in the other end can be characterized uh, as a kind of inalienable context of curriculum and, and it's something to be transmitted. The content should be transmitted. 
or it can be in the other end, a kind of re- critical reflection, uh, what knowledge is worth, what type of, how to choose the right knowledge and so on. And in, in, in the other sector, you can see the ownership uh, from social control towards emancipation. And often this is about the student's role, that is our students something we want to transfer and control that student will get it. Then we are here in this curriculum as control over con- content sections that teachers or the institution decides what are given to students and all receive the same and students have little to say what they will get. It may be also that in this space, it's also the industry who decides the standards uh, uh, fr- from coming from depending on the field, how much there are standards that must be followed, but those are made secure that every student reaches them. Then we move to the second phase to this kind of uh, curriculum as producing competencies. In these processes, students learning is taken more into account that how to uh, students will get all that uh, knowledge, skills, and, and, and capabilities what are needed, and, and it's a bit more advanced. We are not thinking only about the contents or pieces of knowledge, but it's more about producing uh, qualities. But also the working right life relevance is there very strongly present, uh, and students may not have much to say what they should learn. At university. When we go towards this curriculum as negotiating of potentials, then students have equal role and it's also about the, uh, how uh, students, uh, the, the learning conceptions in institutions that do we also see that students are active participants somehow joining uh, that, joining the collection of knowledge, joining the uh, uh, kind of uh, participation, what do we see relevant for our education? And, and then the last section, the highest, I don't know if this is, this is, this shouldn't be normative in a way that in that, that way highest, but of course, if we approach curriculum as empowerment, where the knowledge is more close to critical reflection and, and the ownership is even like emancipation, uh, it doesn't mean that all the other levels are not needed. They all are needed, but it all the time this broadens the spec- spectrum that how broadly we do see the students' access to different types of knowledges, towards this powerful knowledge and symbolic knowledge. Also, that's something that is also for, for developing the qualities and, and developing something we can't even anticipate when we are making curriculum because there may be some things that we if we think that students should be better than us in the future they should solve problems that we cannot solve yet in in the world today so perhaps there should be also room for different type of potentials and 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 openness in in curricula in that sense but let's look now two examples from the field of engineering that how knowledge could be seen. Uh, these are from my ongoing uh, study on, on civil engineering and constructing engineering who have shared pro- program with uh, a university and University of Applied Sciences. And the first citation from teachers says like this, to teach project planning, I don't tell about house building to those who are into infrastructure. Instead, I go for them, I go through track construction, street construction, road construction, project planning. And those are like from another planet compared to building a new uh, house. So frankly speaking, can we talk about the same course? If I, uh, if I taught only one project planning, probably for house building, what is the content benefit for those who aim towards infrastructure? Then another example from an engineering teacher from university. If an, in an exam is asked to draw a solution, usually students from a University of Applied Sciences background give much better answers compared to our undergraduate students at university. However, 
if not the basic case to calculate is not asked, but something different, that some conditions change or need to be added. Students with University of Applied Sciences background step back because the formula that she or he is used to use don't work. So somehow these two examples uh, uh, reflect how uh, context bounded the approach in curriculum knowledge is. This first example has uh, emphasis on context bounded and practical knowledge, whereas the second has on context free and symbolic knowledge or characterizes these features. Whereas the first teacher wants to give exactly those qualities with one sector uh, in engineering would require when they are going to the world of work, the other one shows how this type of quality may be a restriction in a phase that sometimes something happens and, and then the formula you have learned does not work anymore. And, and I would put these two examples here somehow that this first example is close to this curriculum as producing competencies towards working life. But the second example was more about this curriculum as negotiating of potentials, even though it doesn't reflect directly this negotiating perspective, but somehow that there are, uh, there are like, uh, there is some kind of openness in curriculum, how to, uh, what kind of qualities students should achieve. So, there is this fundamental educational dilemma, dilemma in, in higher education that somehow we should transmit the knowledge, competencies and skills and the professional and disciplinary identities to the next generations. But sometimes we also should free the new generations to discover something new that was not even anticipated in curricula. And how to balance between these two to that uh, there is they, they get different type of uh, qualities during the higher education. But now let's go back to this activity system. So as I said, said before that, uh, if the object of activity, uh, if somebody sees curriculum as a, primarily as a mapping the knowledge and skill gaps defined by experts from industry, or, or from the perspective of creating culturally sensitive curriculum or paying attention to students access to powerful forms of knowledge, the object of activity is very different. So if there are two people who approach from other extremes from this figure I showed, so they perhaps don't find shared language to discuss about curriculum issue. And that's why it's important to know what do we mean when we talk about curriculum or curriculum change. The next element in this system is then tools. So in, in the activity system, uh, the tools can be either material or conceptual. And, and in every activity system, actors use already existing, existing tools, but also create new ones. Uh, different types of tools, what we can have in, in curriculum making can be classified as primary, secondary and tertiary tools. The primary tools are quite simple. For example, a protocol of what curriculum should include. For example, boxes to be filled in, in electronic curriculum systems around the world, and which direct curriculum thinking towards the curriculum as product approach, perhaps more, more strongly. Then there are the secondary tools, which are representing representations of primary tools and mediate how actors employ them in practice. So they may be models or explanatory frameworks. In higher education, uh, the widely used model of a constructive alignment by John Bix and Catherine Tang could be characterized as such. So for academics writing curriculum text, this means that instead of list of contents to be taught, teachers should express what the intended learning outcomes are and what a student is expected to learn and achieve during the course. So the language forms a tool, a repertoire with which to talk about the object of the activity and it constructs the re reality we are living. Tertiary two tools are abstractions, for example, uh, a kind of 
paradigms, uh, they may be connected to ideologies or identities, and they are uh, needed to understand why we are doing something, how, why we are doing like this. And, and often curriculum theorists are most in, interested in these. Uh, what are the driving forces behind different kind of curriculum initiatives? And, and usually as, for example, what is today uh, very topical, uh, for example, these micro-credentials or curriculum mapping. So uh, they do not have roots in educational research at all. They come from very different background. And that's, why, that's also something that usually curriculum uh, tools and theories, they somehow come, have some kind of educational legitimation and this is also interesting to see that what may be the uh, like the background of different kind of approaches uh, what are presented in 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 curriculum development uh, areas and and some academics also may be happy for example like in one study it was called that uh, in in context with was it with micro credentials if i remember right that uh, I don't miss this pedagogical jargon at all, uh, but however, for the sake of our very relevant task in education for future generations, perhaps we should stop for a while to think about this educational purpose of higher education. And, and I provide you this, uh, I, I like this uh, Paul Ashwin's uh, quote uh, where he somehow uh, summarizes the educational purpose of a university education. It's not to prepare someone for their role in the future workforce. Rather, the educational purpose of higher education is to bring students into a transformational relationship to knowledge that changes their sense of who they are and what, what they can do in the world. And this also, it's not contradictory. This undoubtedly prepares them to make a contribution to society including the contribution to the labor market. But this is a byproduct of the central educational purpose of higher education rather than its driving force. Okay, but then let's look at the rules. Uh, rules in curriculum making have their formal basis in regulations and standards that originated from, from educational policy, and, and depending on the discipline, there may be certain kind of uh, more strict rules than in some others. And, and yet anyway, higher education seems to have more autonomy compared to basic education in many countries. But there are these formal rules, but also implicit norms and conventions which come to play, play here. And, and uh, one question here is that when academics perceive tools as requirements. So the tools I was discussing just earlier, if they are uh, perceived as requirements or demands by, by those with power, so instead of being useful for a subject to in engage in the object of activity, tools may be employed as rules. As an example, curriculum mapping represents a tool by which to think of how to ensure that certain topic skills and contents are included in curricula. And, and if this is implemented, like online curriculum maps implemented at matrices or forms to be filled, filled out, they may constrain the curriculum offerings to keep them on track and under control. And, and if it's used in, in only in this instrumental way, they perhaps don't engage academics so well in this enterprise to making curriculum. So like there is one from one of our studies, one academic says that we were given such instructions and restrictions that did not improve the work here. Rather, we were required to struggle against those to prevent or alleviate them so that we could have a territory where, could, where, where we could work reasonably. So perhaps this, this professor was more about uh, wanting to see also the pedagogical entity, the processes of learning, the whole curriculum as a as a like a bigger thing than just pieces of knowledge to be mapped in a way, and also uh, 
wanting to have some openness in curriculum and in 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 a way it different type of tool, tools are 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 changing towards the rules uh, that doesn't support it may also uh, be non motivating for academics but now we move on those academics themselves. So academics, teachers, subjects, actors, how do we want to call them? So they are the key, key people doing curriculum and, and also the community of significant others with whom they are doing, who are the other stakeholders in this, uh, in this curriculum change enterprise. And when we think about the activity system, uh, also all these, uh, the, the community of significant others and the actors, the rules also have quite uh, important role mediating uh, the work they are aiming to do. Uh, and I would now approach this uh, subjects or actors in this activity system uh, with the concept of agency. So agencies uh, is in, in curriculum change can be characterized as a negotiating process of relationship with different structures that constrain or, or, or enable the agency. So it's not, my approach to agency is not that it's just individuals who do things or it's about the individuals. It's about the relationship with the environment, with the whole system, which can uh, motivate them or demotivate them to do things or enable or constrain of them doing things. So we did uh, a study of uh, academics agency in curriculum, uh, curriculum change in two different types of uh, situations. <clears throat> the one, one curriculum change was uh, at departmental level and the other one was uh, university wide. And it was surprising that the agency of academics was quite similar, despite the scope or, or broadness of these, these changes. <clears throat> and I will now sh go shortly through these uh, six different profiles, what we identify. <clears throat> so these all of these people who were uh, uh, interviewed uh, were members of curriculum development teams. So, and, and it was quite evident that many of them had this progressive agency. They had interest towards the student learning and teaching, and they, ha they had readiness to take responsibility. And even though there were structural constraints, they, they were creative. I think they had this bricolage uh, way of that, okay, some rules come and how to uh, adjust them to our department, our faculty, so that this change is going to be meaningful. But they want to go go forward with the curriculum change and 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 somehow help student learning through these new curriculum initiatives. Oppositional agency was quite opposite, even though these people were members of curriculum development teams. There were people who did not have any interest in curriculum change. They regarded it something that's not scholars' work. They were very critical against curriculum initiatives in general and had active resistance or withdrawal from the processes. And, and many of them also consider that it's something related to administration. It's not, not uh, academics' work. Then there was this territorial agency. Also, uh, in a way, progressive uh, interest towards protecting the high status of disciplinary territorial was still there, like the key feature here that they did not want to collaborate, they did not want to be similar to others. They had power inside the university in a way that they could uh, have a kind of uh, exceptional rules for them. And, and for some disciplines, they have this type of possibility that they have so strong position that they can uh, define their borders more strictly than some other. Then bridge building agency also appeared. Uh, and this 
can be characterized as a mediator between the interest groups at university, labor market, society, and they were those who were accepting the negative feedback from others, from the people with whom they were working, but also they tried to adapt and try to do the things which they need to do. And, and many of these were also uh, in a leading position in the curriculum teams. Uh, those academics with accommodating agency did not have much passion, but they did not have either resistance. They just accepted the cows as part of curriculum development and academic work and focused on the rational processes of developing curriculum and avoiding conflicts. These five uh, again profiles appeared in the university-wide curriculum change, but, but also in the departmental uh, change. So it, it wasn't about the size of the change, but coverless agency was the only one which also which appeared in only in university-wide curriculum change. There are similar features with the uh, progressive agency. Uh, they there was a want, want to contribute, but no status or no space to have agency in curriculum change, and that caused frustration and disappointment. And how these uh, agencies appeared. So there was this uh, kind of uh, the, the relations to structures is, is very evident in a way that there are these individual questions that what are you, what is your position at university? Uh, what kind of identity do you have? It's more like researcher identity or teacher identity, how, how engaged you are as individual. But it also related to this uh, community, questions of community, that what, are, what is the disciplinary culture and the pedagogical culture and the social cultures and relationship that how uh, shared object of activity the, the people with whom you are working have. And if there isn't like a share idea, what, what is this all about and how do we engage? Of course, there comes tensions then and you may not have space to use your agency. And the institutional layer also is, is there. What is the institutional design? What are the management practices? What are the resources which may be different for different actors and people? So it's not about only about individuals. It's also about different uh, environment and different stu structures around. So uh, I want to emphasize that we shouldn't, if, if something, if people, don't engage in curriculum change, uh, we should uh, not only blame the managerial structures or, or something like macro views that this is all about the educational policy or this is all about the university, which is giving us requirements that we cannot fulfill. But on the other hand, we should not judge teachers that it's about teachers, they are unwilling to change. Uh, they, they always resist and so on. It's not, not a, either about individuals. It's, it's about the relationship between agency and structural processes and the social cultures and relationships and, and the local community with its disciplinary pedagogical and social cultures and relationships seem to have a key role for the individual and collegial agency in curriculum change. So, uh, last but not least, the division of labor is, is there, and, and just shortly about that. So, curriculum making always have some kind of hidden rules and raise questions. Who has agency and who has power and how to have them in curriculum making? And, and there are also differences between different disciplines and their status, in, in this, especially in big university-wide reforms. But what is important to note that uh, we just should not stick into this, oh, this is too complicated, too problematic. Uh, tenses and contradictions could be transformed to as innovative ideas and solutions so that we try to find uh, small steps. Uh, we try to use different types of tools, different levels of tools. We try to to implement the rules creatively. Uh, we try to find new processes, new practices, so that uh, gradually the bigger system level changes may transform the entire course of action.
So now all these uh, features of the activity system or components, uh, as I said before, that curriculum change, especially change situations, is complicated action, it's complicated activity system. And I, I hope that this talk helped you to understand why it is sometimes complicated. My understanding is that the most important element in this system is that we have more or less similar understanding what curriculum is. And if it's for some a tool or a system or for some other a process where students are educated and prepared for unknown future, this should be discussed. Our, what is our understanding? What is our approach? I see curriculum and curriculum change as one of the few places where it is possible to meet and negotiate of the key issues concerning the academia. How research and teaching are related and how to support students' encounters with knowledge. As Ronald Barnett said, to have a personal relationship with knowledge. It's a place to negotiate of the relation between academia and the world outside, the societal relevance of university education. It's a place to put on a table the possible tensions between internal and external objectives, the scientific, educational and pedagogical and administrative practices, and the individual and collective interests. Universities has a sig significant role in educating the next generation of scholars and knowledge workers to different sectors of society and curriculum is a core element in their education as it is a key means of putting the whole, whole uh, idea of a university into practice. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to hear if you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Johanna. Um, I think we have some questions in the chat box and I ask the host to allow participants to unmute yourself. So the first question is from Rodrigo. Um, can you turn on your mic and ask your question? Is it possible? Okay, he's not here. Probably I would um, read his question in the chat box then. Johanna, the question is, the state of affairs in the world is forcing people to reinvent themselves with some frequency. Chris Deed talks about the 60-year curriculum, the notion that your first degree is only that, the first. Question is, is it really critical to have a structured curriculum if it only set the initial agenda of the new engineers? Well, thank you. This is really a good and difficult question to answer. A structured curriculum. Well, I think that uh, somehow I see uh, curriculum, I see the higher education institutions role really important, especially uh, that I think higher education is the only place where you can learn things you can't learn in everyday life and you can't learn from experience. And there is a lot of things what we can learn from experience and, and, and learn by working and learn by doing things. But, but there are certain type of uh, especially this type of structured and, and uh, uh, symbolic and hierarchical types of knowledges, which is especially hierarchical in natural sciences, that you need a kind of basis to construct. And then uh, more, the, more, the, more the, like a practical uh, applications then can be learned throughout the life and throughout the career. But uh, I don't quite understand quite well what is the structured curri curriculum uh, specifically. Does it mean specifically something about this? Yeah, but... may I clarify? Do, yes. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 
You know, uh, I read this book by Chris D.D. from the MIT, and he says, we are all going to come back to the university every 10, 15, 20 years, and we are going to work like 60 years. Not us probably, but uh, the young people that we teach. And uh, so, and, and we are seeing, uh, watching uh, technology changes in education that will provide the easy occasions to be retrained, re-educated, and we should, uh, you know, move our paradigm from, uh, okay, you spend five years in this place and at the end you are an engineer and you're ready for life to a new paradigm where you need to reinvent yourself and you will be helped by universities to do so. That's, that's my point that uh, the curriculum that you were presenting on is the first curriculum, but you will have like three or four curriculums in your life. Yes, that, that's true. And, and, and this kind of life-wide or lifelong learning, but it, it's, a, it's very topical today also. But when I think about this first curriculum, this first three or four or five years, when, when young people come to university, they are also... Uh, uh, it's, it's there like a first experience of uh, uh, getting encounters with knowledge and getting encounters with this professional field or specific field. And, and there is this uh, many, many scholars who, who emphasize that uh, there should be a kind of process, a kind of continue where the this kind of, it's not only about uh, building knowledge and, or building skills, but it's also about building uh, identity. And if you have pieces of knowledge from there and there, it's very, uh, it's like a buffer table. And you perhaps don't have a coherent identity for anything. You just know that I can do that there and that there, but somehow I'm, I'm strongly favor this type of uh, processual uh, curriculum for bachelor and, and master's degree. And, and of course, after that, then there is this uh, lifelong, lifelong uh, learning and, and perhaps some pieces of those uh, longer degrees could be used for those who come after every five years or after every three, three years or 10 years come to update their knowledges. But they already have the basic understanding and usually these people also have a lot of knowledge from working life already. So it's a bit different approach for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have another question from Jens. Would you please unmute yourself and then ask the question? Sure. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, academics as uh, curriculum creators. Um, so I was just wondering what, what you see, what, what does it require to create curriculum? Because what I see in, in many cases is small changes, evolution of, of the curriculum rather than uh, what we could call revolution of, of curriculum. Uh, so, so, so what's the, what should I say, unit of study or what should I, should I call here? What, what, what is it and, and are there differences in, in the tensions and, and power struggles and stuff like that, whether it's kind of a curriculum revolution, meaning we are creating a new curriculum or we are really re-eventing or whatever we should call it, a curriculum rather than just evolving the curriculum. Yes, yes. I think both, both phases happen that sometimes it's, it's, it's as you say that it's very incremental and, and uh, you, you every time you update something, you, you update, and that's also one confusion what happens that when it's, when it's stated now we have a new curriculum change and some people start to just change the books. <laughs> and, and some think that it's a huge reform and, and that, that may also cause uh, misconceptions and misunderstanding between participants there. Uh, Sometimes it's enough, and I think it's also for the well-being of academics and teachers not to reform it profoundly too often. But still, sometimes it's really important to look everything with uh, new eyes. That is this still valid what we have had? 
does this work? What is something that, because there is also this tendency that there comes more and more requirements from around the university, uh, from industry that you should teach this and this and this, and also from research comes new knowledge and, and the curriculum is, there is more and more stuff in it. And, and at the same time, we are very not so eager to leave out anything. And that's also one reason that we should make some selections and, and approach this now and then as a more coherent entity and look all day, not just my course, but the whole degree program on the whole, whole um, study. What, what, is, what are the contents? What are the processes inside? Right. Even though the time is up, but then I think the questions and discussion is interesting, so I would extend a little bit of the Q and A here. Uh, Christina, you have a question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, for an interesting talk. Um, so you mentioned the critique against uh, learning outcomes, and uh, um, I mean I would definitely share every critique against instrumental use and like mechanistic, rationalistic use of that. But I, I'd be really curious to understand what are the qualities of a curriculum that could not be expressed as learning outcomes? Yes, it's perhaps related also to these, uh, some instructions which have been followed, this, this approach of learning outcomes. For example, there has been a list of a lot verbs you can use and verbs you shouldn't use. For example, that you should not use the verb understand when you are making the, the language for, for learning outcomes. And depending on, on the field of science, for example, in social sciences, teachers and academics say that understanding is one of the key ideas. And I can I identify from a student's essay that if this person has understood or not, so in a way that there comes very kind of rigid rules and also that another rule is that everything must be able to assess. If you, if you write a learning outcome, that must be something that you can measure it. But if we think that university is a place where students should be, they should be learning, they should be better than professors in the future, they should innovate or find something more. If we can define that, then we are behind already. So there should be some openness that students uh, are encouraged to achieve more than what we can anticipate when we are writing these sentences of learning outcomes. So somehow that, of course, there is this student perspective and it's important to pay attention that we are not just teaching, we also think what they should be learning but also to leave some uh, openness to this approach that uh, not to follow the, this type of uh, rules or tools to reach it way. But I mean, it's fully possible to express the openness in the learning outcomes. Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> but of course, all the one-to-one uh, -one with the criteria and uh, there is a lot of stupid use of it, but but fundamentally, yeah. I think it should be possible to express yeah. even quite uh, um, high level learning and empowerment. Yeah, yeah. Let's. I I think it it is possible, but it's it's also it requires quite a lot from academic staff, especially if they are not pedagogically aware or how much they have energy to put on that work in a way that like, like one of, in one of the interviews I had, I remember a professor said that something that this is so big mental twist that I, I need much more time to think about it, not just to get the list of verbs which are allowed or not allowed. It's, it's a big change and, and I need more time to discuss and understand this whole uh, new way of thinking, new mindset. All right, so I think we come to uh, maybe the last question. Uh, Petros, are you there? Would you like to turn on the mic and ask the question? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, my question is related to the future of higher education institutions. Um, so there is an abundance of educational content available 
everywhere. And already some, um, some companies are thinking of launching programs uh, where they just curate content. Um, do you think, obviously this, this will be more difficult in practical uh, studies like engineering, uh, and there is also issues of accreditation. But do you think that uh, higher educational institutions are changing? And, and wh where, where do you see the, their future? Will they turn more to curating than creating content? Well, that's a, I'm a bit worried about this trend that whoever can create a university, and, and especially in some of these, these new ways of thinking about uh, for example, these micro credentials seem to have a kind of shortcut to knowledge. I see it as, as, as if there was a shortcut to knowledge. And, and if there are technological enterprises behind, like uh, activities which are dressed like they are educational, but still they are very market oriented. So I wonder what is the role of university? We still should have universities should have the highest knowledge and we should somehow be separate from, from the society, even though we serve the society, but somehow uh, perhaps more lead the way not to go behind. But, but what, may, what may, may result here is that universities uh, pay more attention to the environment where they are working. They, they, they need to pay, pay attention more to the student employability and so on, but also it may be that there come only some elite institutions which focus, which are like traditional and some others are some kind of mixed and uh, I, I wish that there still stays also this kind of uh, access to, to power, powerful knowledge and access also to critically approach the phenomenon of what is happening today, not just follow what is happening in the environment and in the professional fields. But, but it's, there are changes all the time. Thank you. All right. So um, I, uh, I think we should have to end uh, the, the session here. And we have two or three more questions. So I, I will send these questions to Johanna. And she is in Huva with us. So um, I, she would answer the question to Huva, and then we all got to see what's her idea. And with Johanna, she always has all answers uh, when it comes to education. Thank you so much. So as promised, this is a very exciting moment. I told you that we would have a group photo in this new normal situation. So um, the local host is ready to do the screen shot capture. Please uh, put on your makeup lipsticks and then turn on the video smile. It will take one minute. So just freeze to your best pose starting now. This is so much fun than I thought. Everyone looks perfect. So beautiful, handsome, everyone. I think I'm turning to the page four, three and four and we still see all black screen. <laughs> so <laughs> please continue to smile. It would take one minute. Or change your pose, it's also fine. Then you go. Like this? Yes. This is my <laughs> president. My <boss. laughs> All right, then. Um, yeah. Um, Why we are uh, taking these photos. And um, I would just tell you that um, next session would be a regional meeting. So uh, we already have the channels open. So please go to your respect regions if you are collaborators and member schools and after the regional meeting there is uh, two more special workshop session that would start 7 p.m my time that's uh university as engines of economic development making knowledge exchange work by Edward Crawley and Christina and then um at 10 
from uh, PM My Time, um, Sarah and her team uh, offers a second run on her workshop of global citizens and ethical engineers with in our CDO program workshop, they are both uh, interesting workshops that are available today until nighttime here in Bangkok. So thank you very much for joining this keynote speaker. Thank you, Johanna. Um, honor to have uh, President Song Mai with us and uh, Wise Dean from Faculty of Engineering, <laughs> uh, Chai, uh, to, to, to join us in this session. And see you again today, tonight, and tomorrow for the last day of CDIO. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for very uh, stimulating talks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. See you then. That's Simon. Uh, President of my room, Simon from Hello, Hello, Simon. Hello, Sumai Sensei. Hello, Professor Simon. How are you? Very good, thank you. <laughs> I have to congratulate you on becoming uh, president as well. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. ขอบคุณมากนะครับอาจารย์ลังกีขอบคุณมากนะครับอาจารย์ลังกีขอบคุณมากนะครับอาจารย์ลังกีขอบคุณมากนะครับอาจารย์ลังกีขอบคุณม